Good morning, St. Paul's. Happy fourth Sunday in Lent. So, I was about to say this morning something a little bit different. I guess you're used to that. I, I probably do something a little bit different all the time. But this really might be a, a bit strange. I don't know if you have seen on YouTube uh, this challenge called the, and I'm going to botch the pronunciation. It's a Scandinavian word. Sir Strumming Fish Challenge. And basically, Sir Strumming is this um, salted, fermented fish from Sweden that's packaged in these tins. Then it continues to ferment in there. And so often these tins are kind of bulging um, because of the expansion of what's going on in there. And so it shows these various people who are going to try to eat this stuff. And invariably when they pierce the can this liquid spews everywhere and evidently it must smell ghastly uh, because it causes people kind of an involuntary gag reflex and i know i'm weird i think it's incredibly funny i mean i have watched several of these videos and i'm just crying uh, because i think it's so funny these people trying to deal with this stinky fish uh, and really hardly able to, to do it. Uh, it. It's so revolting, evidently. Um, so I thought we would do it this morning. We're going to lock the doors and open up a few cans and <laughs> just kidding. Um, might be fun though. Anyway, Believe it or not, in Sweden, there's a proper way to eat this stuff, evidently, and there are people who like it if it's done properly. And um, It made me think of that southeastern tropical fruit called durian, which also evidently really stinks, but some people really like it. Well, what's this got to do with Lent and our faith? Maybe nothing, but um, I picked up a few kind of parallels or analogies as I was thinking about this, particularly as I was reading Ephesians, our Ephesians passage uh, this week. There's a, a portion in there. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses. God loved us even when we were dead in our sin. So, people who engage with this Sir Stroming nasty fish, and some people actually like it, you know, it may be that God loves us even when we are, are dead, are smelling rather rank. Um, you know, that fish, which was once fresh, uh, I don't know, if it's hairy, I guess. It's undergone uh, a process through salting and fermentation, etc., and it's transformed into something that, frankly, is um, on the face of it unpleasant or because it causes involuntary gag reflexes and I mean everybody I've seen open these cans well it, it served kind of as a visual um, reminder to me this metaphor of how the darkness and sin in our lives can spiritually transform us into something that's dead and unpleasant right um, we might not recognize it all the time but it still has this effect in our lives so God loves us even when we were dead and I, I think just ponder that this week um, we take so much time trying to get cleaned up thinking this is uh, what gets God to uh, embrace us but no he it says again let me read it 
God who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses. It reminds me again, and I've mentioned this the last several weeks, uh, it's just been on my mind, and that's the parable of the prodigal son, right? It's the same image of the father, the loving father. He runs, runs out to meet his son who smells the equivalent of Sir Stroming, stinky, rotted fish, right? He's been living with the pigs. He's, um, it, it's an abomination to everything they believe. And it doesn't deter dad in the slightest. Love, love doesn't take that into consideration. Hear that. Love is not deterred by our condition. Love is going to love. It's what it does. So the father runs out undeterred. In the slightest. And the father who is rich in mercy, out of his great love, embraces this son who is stinky, who is wasteful, sinful, rebellious, ungrateful. But love loves. The condition doesn't deter it. And I hope that's what you hear today. And that you, you dwell on it. I mean, really dwell on it. God's love is not put off by death or sin or decay. Instead of recoiling from the stench, like these videos, you know, they pierce this thing, this nasty juice squirts out. And I mean, everybody is trying to get away from this stuff. Instead of recoiling from our stench, he embraces us in our darkness. In fact, it's almost like he's more drawn to us. Why? <laughs> it's the lost sheep, right? I mean, you leave the 99 to go for the one who's in trouble. It, the shepherd is drawn to go find the one who needs help, and that's us. Hear that. Think about how embracing us in our darkness transcends a God who solely embraces us in the light. And we spend so much time in our own efforts, in our own defining of what the light actually even is, to try to clean ourselves up so God will, <clears throat> I guess, hug us a little deeper. And we miss the point. Loving us at our worst. And then what does this Ephesians passage go on to say? So he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses at our worst. What made us alive. He's the one that made us alive. Together with Christ. And raised us up with Christ. And seated us with Christ in heavenly places. That's almost too much to deal with. <laughs> I mean, so when you receive communion, think about that. God has seated you with Christ in heavenly places. You have a place at the table with your name on it, a place card, your name. Imagine it written there in the most beautiful calligraphy. There it is. And it's important to remember that that place card at that table is something that God has done for you. You didn't earn that place card. In fact, you smelled like Sir Stroman when your name was embossed on that place card and placed at that table. You were dead, unable to do any of this for yourself. And God himself has seated you at the table. It's, it's the saying, you've heard it, it's God loves the unlovable, right? He loves the unlovable. He regards those whom we would reject and discard 
with honor. Embraces them. Raises them up to places of dignity. To use maybe our fish analogy, we think that the only thing acceptable is perfectly presented salmon steaks. He takes Sir Strumming. He's not offended or put off or deterred at all. He does this for us. And so think of it. This is a, a verse, Romans 4, 17. God gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Right? He's the one doing it. We can, we can forget about our notions of getting this seat at the table. I mean, it's good to hear those words again. That God, out of his rich mercy, out of his love, loved us even when we were dead. And he made us alive with Christ. You didn't do that. I don't care how many prayers you've prayed, how many times you've had communion, you've had perfect attendance at church, you've served the poor. That's everything you've done. It doesn't list any of that here. He made you alive. He made you alive and me alive together with Christ. He raised us up. And he seated us with Christ in heavenly places. <laughs> we get so hung up on the how, right? How does God do this? How does God lift us up, raise us up? How does God love us? And how, and we toil on the how. And then once we've done that for a good while, we get equally preoccupied and argue about the with whom has God done this. Well, did God do it with these people or because they've done this or has he done it with these people? And we spend so much energy on the how and the with whom. It says he did it. Can we not trust God to do what he says he's going to do? I mean, I've, look, I'm guilty too. I've spent so much energy on the how all of this is. How can I make sure that I'm part of the people that he raises up? Well, it says he does it. He's taking care of that. Right? Can we be content to let God do this? I mean, he's doing it anyway. <laughs> Can we be satisfied that he's going to do it and leave it at that? Or must we, like Job, demand explanation from God? As silly as it might sound, if, and it does sound silly, if we can let God be God, if we can just let God be God and quit our feeble attempts to clarify the mystery of death and resurrection and instead, enjoy the privilege of simply being a witness to his goodness. Well, that would not only do you and me a world of good, it would do the world a world of good. It would do the church a world of good. If we can simply quit demanding explanation for the how and for whom's and enjoy the witness of his goodness. Several, I think, weeks or months ago, I spoke to you about the, the kind of senselessness of empirically defining a beautiful sunset, right? It's because these dust particles, and, and I, that's interesting, but it, it's not the point, right? It, it, the point is to behold the sunset and what it does on the inside of us that's beyond definition and explanation. It's one of those mysteries. Why does the sunset affect our, the chemistry in our bodies? I, I don't know exactly, but the beholding. For all of our blathering and all of our joy 
about God's grace, we spend a great amount of energy inserting what we think we understand about that grace as the centerpiece. Our definitions of grace become the centerpiece rather than the grace itself. It is God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, not us. As I said earlier, God, he doesn't give us clean explanations about how. He just tells us that he's the one who loves us when we're dead, makes us alive with Christ, raises us up, and seats us. He doesn't tell us how he does it. He just tells us that he does it. He tells us why, though. Why does he do it? Out of his great love. Out of his great love. So the why we get, out of his mercy and his great love, this is what he does. But he also tells us the trajectory, the purpose, combined with this why, out of his love, but where is all of this going? What's the purpose of this amazing love for us? Well, if you keep reading in Ephesians here, it says, seats us with him in heavenly places so that, trajectory, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So this amazing love does these amazing things for us. He doesn't tell us how or for whom, but that's his business. Why? So that he can show us, <laughs> he can show us the immeasurable riches of of his grace in kindness. What's his grace look like? Kindness. That's what he that's where we're heading. In the ages to come, he's going to show you his grace in kindness. Wow. I mean, who knows what that might even look like? This is beautifully refreshing stuff. The unfortunate part, and I was just having coffee with my wife earlier this morning. And Mary said, and we were talking about another piece of scripture. <clears throat> but she said something that fits so well with what I wanted to say this weekend. She said, you know, we take the story of Jesus and the, and the scriptures. And we, as people, so often complicate them that we squeeze the life right out of it. <laughs> Yeah, we spend so much energy on the hows and the for whoms. This good news, we squeeze the good right out of it. It's just news then. We complicate it and squeeze the life right out of it. You know, Isaiah talks about that our righteousness, our kind of... Um, the, the way we are with God, if you want to put it that way. Our, our standing, you can say it that way with God, but our, our relationship, our interaction with God. Isaiah says, our righteousness is like filthy rags. Sirstrumi, right? Our righteousness smells like this rotten fish. But consider this. We often think, well, that's, we equate our righteousness with, we, if we would just do the right thing, then we would be righteous. I think it misses the point. It misses the point. Just like the prodigals. I mean, remember the entirety of what the, the message talks about. It's about relationship. I think the reason our righteousness is like rotten fish and rags is because we don't consider the relationship and we demand the hows and the for whoms. And then once we define that, then we start working our way towards it. We miss the mark on righteousness because we've equated it with stuff that we do. When he tells us here, he's the one who does it. This is mighty, refreshing, beautiful, heady stuff. But good news for a bunch of folks who often smell like putrid fish. 
Happy Fourth Sunday in Lent. Amen.